Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to Centre Stage and the first Water and Communications of the World Water Week 2024. We're here to discuss making communicating water everyone's business. The water community has been told that we need to be better at communicating our issues, our agendas, to the broader public. To discuss this today, I'm very happy to bring on stage four distinguished panelists. I'd like to join me, Caroline Studeman, CEO, CEO Viva Con Agua. Hello. <laughs> I'd like to welcome on stage Mattis Samuel, Principal, Policy Insights, Economist Impact. I'd like to say standing ovations are also completely okay if you want. <laughs> Lastly, on stage, I'd like to wel welcome Ines Breda, Senior Manager, Global Partnerships Group, External Relationships, Vernfoss. And joining us online from Egypt, Rahab Abd al science journalist. And I'd like to start, as they say, at the very beginning of this story, of the A to Z, getting the information. I want to ask you, Mattis, and then coming to you, Rahab, online, how easy is it to get the information, A, to the person asking, and to reach the right audiences. And given that, and tell us if I'm wrong, that the conversation around water has become that much more complex, that much more challenging, and that much more critical, has this made your job easier? Or has it made it harder? <laughs> Mattis, I want to start with you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a fantastic question, really important. And thank you for uh, running the, the panel, and thank you for the, to the organizers for another fantastic year of uh, the World Water Week. So I think that is the question at the very heart of uh, water, data, and communication. Uh, unfortunately, our job has not become easier. Uh, it has become more challenging, but also more exciting. Um, and the problem is, or the issue is with the data and communication is that data itself is a tool. Um, it can be an extremely powerful tool, uh, but it's a double-edged sword. Um, in, depending on the audiences, um, of course, it can help to inform and construct the narrative, the story. Um, you know, the fact that 50% uh, of the world population living, is living in water-stressed areas um, is, is, is a powerful message. Um, the fact that 1,000 children uh, die every day because of water-related diseases is extremely powerful message. For economists, the fact that we are missing out on 5 to 6% uh, of GDP is incredibly powerful. But at the same time, data um, is easy to misinterpret and uh, misconstruct. And therefore, um, especially nowadays when, as you said, the conversation around water has become more complex, the conversation around climate change has become more complex, it's really, really important that we are careful about how we use data, how we communicate data, and um, that we also work with the audiences to really understand and utilize the, the data in um, the right way. So now with that, I want to turn to Rahab, who's working with data and the real stories on the ground and bring them to the public. Rahab, what's been your experience? Yeah. We don't hear you if you're... Perfect. Yes.
Thank you so much, Rahab. I think what you say, bringing these conversations to centre stage for the Water Week to take this conversation and make it important enough to have here is part of this storytelling and part of creating the importance we want to give to communicating water and issues like the Nile. But Ines, now, of course, you've heard from the storytellers. You've heard from the gathering of information. You've heard the challenges and the strategies that are being deployed to get the information to you. In your position as industry, how are you dealing with this inflow of information? Are you understanding it? Are you assessing it? Are you utilizing it in the best way? Because, of course, as Matt has said, it is data that is constructed and informed, but it begs the question. Yes, it's a very relevant question in, the, in current uh, days. I have to say that, uh, first of all, I think the data is available. And, of course, my engineering background and my PhD in chemistry and bioscience and water treatment has definitely helped me navigate the abundance of data uh, and be critical about it, especially at a time where we discuss misinformation, disinformation. At the same time, we've also seen some very good advancements on research-based policies and how data can really empower policymakers. Um, and, and I feel like that's a trend that we'll continue, we'll continue to see. But I think that the biggest asset I've been having and using on my day job has been the access to an international network. Because data without the context understanding, the contextualized understanding of the data, it means very little. We have to look at the data and, and again, sometimes generalized numbers that we are able to pull out that somehow can drag some attention, are not able to, to lead the ambitions that we need to, be, to, to lead and inspire without the contextualized understanding of where that data sits. So I'll say that that's the key link for me. I think what you're saying about critical review that is so important when it comes to data because you have so much. How do we filter? How do we understand this? How do we decide what we can do to make impact and change our behaviors depending where we sit? And that leads me to you, Caroline, because of course, Viva Con Agua is doing different things. You're bringing new energy to the discussion. You're bringing new solutions to the discussion. When we spoke earlier, you said something very important that I'd like to bring onto stage here which is that we, as individuals consuming this data, which has just gotten ex ex exceptional over the last few years, there is a trauma response that's happening. We're individualizing our actions. We're looking at the stage in front of us, not ahead, not where we need to go together. And what Viva Con Agua is doing is breaking this cycle and bringing back collective action for impact. Tell us about this. <laughs> Oh, thank you for that question. And I think everything starts with why. And it started for us to having a very strong vision, water for all. And the importance of that vision is that it's very emotional connected. So it's making people realizing we are water. We are all made of water. We are existing because water exists. And making this emotional uh, connection for the people is the starting point for us. And it's also about the storytelling, getting emotional storytelling in there to make people be more part of that, uh, that story themselves. And then the vision has also another part, and that is all for water. Because reaching a vision is just possible through collective action. And speaking about communication here, we are talking sometimes a lot about understanding, collecti uh, collective understanding, but from our point of view, it's not that much about understanding, but more about collective action, really getting active. And so activation, the activational part, is core of all our activities. And that is based on the frame frameworks of the IDGs, where the inner development plays an important role. But it's also strengthening communities and having a system strengthening approach in general. Bringing together, you said, breaking the cycle, but also breaking the silos, really supporting that people coming together, talking together, co-creating together. And this is possible when you have strong communities, when you're fostering trust, trust in self-efficacy, but also trust in the collective power. And that's why what we try to support with different method methodologies, um, I will zoom into that later, but uh, maybe collaboration is one of the key aspects of it. And when I think of bringing also together industry, researchers, companies, so from different perspectives, 
how can we bring them together in a collaboration and that always works if they feel the ownership themselves, if they are co-developing um, the vision themselves and then feel the ownership to actually reaching the results. I want to actually come to Rehab to comment on what Caroline is saying because of course you tell us about the struggles that you're having with the selective audience in terms of making your stories heard and visible. And Caroline is talking about the emotional links we can make to the story. Of course, there's quantified links that matters can make, but the emotional link can drive us forward faster. And I'd like to ask you, Rahab, what do you find when you're talking about community, you're talking about local stories, about using this strategy to actually make and actually break the barriers that you faced and to build these bridges? Thanks, Rob, because I'm actually going to take that emotion, of course, is valuable. Emotional, it, you can harness that emotion, but it can get misled. It can be misused. And that's where evidence comes in. That's where quantification comes in. Trust is important, but trust needs some basis. Mm -hmm. And Mattis, I'm coming to you with this question. I'm pointing at you. You have the next <laughs> question. It's important to quantify water. And by doing that, quantify risk. By quantifying risk, as you have said, you can understand the cost of inaction and the value of action. You work for government and industry. You create the data sets that are asked for to make the information known. What I'd like to ask you today, as far as you can share with us, what work have you done where you've seen the shift because of the data you've provided where there would otherwise have been inaction? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think that uh, what I'm hearing as well is the, the, that balance between data and emotions is absolutely critical. It's very difficult, but it's absolutely essential, particularly in the low trust environment that we are facing, whether it's traditional media, whether it's institutions, whether it's consultants, whether it's governments, um, whether it's big business low trust environment uh, and that's where the balance between emotions and data is absolutely essential and we have seen that uh, and I uh, just come back to the point on context right context matters and finding that right balance depends on context so for example what we have seen and we have worked with uh, governments local and national in the Middle East uh, on water and food nexus quite a lot and there in that context there was definitely an issue with data availability or data quality and so there uh, our approach has been quite uh, heavily data focused so we have created a lot of new assessment when it comes to the economy impacts of water stress when it comes to the actual um, impacts on what on food systems um, and when it comes to food loss food waste as well and we have seen some gradual progress in that area of paying more attention investing more in prevention of uh, food loss food waste um, 
On the other hand, in other contexts, um, in our work on the city water index, for example, in the US and Latin America, um, the data and the information about the cost of inaction has not been um, a major issue. The data has almost been there. We just needed to um, create the um, situation, the, the environment for exchanging best practices, for exchanging information, for learning, um, and especially thinking about water and the risks associated from water um, scarcity or um, from too much water, so risk of floods, um, to, to think about it in the right context, which is the context of economic risk for businesses, right? How does this impact potentially their bottom line? And there, again, we have started to see that um, companies that we worked with started to integrate water assessments much more into their strategic risk assessments. And that's, again, a different approach, different audience, different context. And I think that really matters. But similar in that you need to learn to speak the same language, <laughs> that we need to use the same key words to get the reactions that we need. And we need to understand your audience to develop that language. And I think you said something really interesting that connects Rehab to what you were talking about, which is low trust areas. And how do you improve trust in these areas with data, but also with stakeholder engagement? Because now I'm going to put the question to Caroline and to Ines. Is low trust just not being visible? Is it that your stakeholders are unaccounted for in a, in a situation, in a question like water that is so emotional, so cultural, so multi-nuanced? If that is the case, how do you, in your position as industry and you in your position with Viva Con Agua, address this to make water more visible? Caroline, I'm going to start with you and then Ines, I come to you. Yeah, from my point of view, really involving society and civil society is crucial for any changes. And I think we really need to bring water much more into the mainstream. And what you said, Matos, the basis is, of course, the information and the data. But still, we need to get more people and stakeholders involved and create a trust environment where actually change can happen. And there's one great example that I just would like to point out because it felt very inspiring to me um, because we use a methodology be for behavioral change because this is really creating new cultures of behavior, new cultures of aspirations. And we are using the universal languages. So languages like what, um, music, arts, sports, everything that is very energetic, that is bringing people together, that is where everyone feels quite connected, very open, and also where this trust is really felt in the nervous system without cognitively realizing it. And using this atmosphere to create something new and create new experiences. And we did that with, in six different states, um, a dance for wash campaign uh, with the motto, shake it, break it, wash it, make it. Yes. That is, and I can hear the song in my head. It was top one in the, in the charts in one, in one country. And it really got the people inspired, following it along, and it reached um, a lot of youth, 1.2 million youth and young adults who all participated in changing habits around hand washing and making it turning schoolyards into show stages and really doing it multi-channel, analog events and meeting different social media campaigns. So to reach a lot of people with a positive approach and then create momentum, create memory, create a new experience to get into this feeling of trust and togetherness. And then we come again to the part that we had a little bit in the beginning of the discussion. So how can we have strengthened communities or communities who are collectively making changes and achieving a different status quo in the future? Thanks, Caroline. And yes. Um, so I, I have to say that as soon as I heard the song, I started dancing. <laughs> and, and I do not believe in leaders who do not dance. So I should say that as well. But it's super fun that we're touching upon the issue of trust and, and visibility because a couple of weeks ago, some young water professionals from Grunfoss came to me and asked me if you had to change something in the sector for impact, what it would it be? And I told them I would make water visible to all, so turn the visible into visible. And immediately they said, oh, that's a reverse Harry Potter cape. <laughs> and I was like, sure. Uh, 
Um, but it has been actually key to establish this environment of trust, but I have to add a little piece here, and that is an environment of trust that allows everyone involved to connect with their sense of purpose. And that, because that for me is more core, more stable than emotion. Uh, emotionals, we, we vary across the day, uh, across phases of life, but our purpose is very much core. Uh, and therefore I wanted to touch upon that. And I have seen it work in multiple scenarios. So some in conversations between leaders and, and myself, when preparing a speech, where my focus is trying to understand what is the passion and the purpose of that leader for the water sector, and then adjusting the speech so that we can make sure that the delivery fits, right? Um, and then also between, I mean, uh, one of the partnerships that, that I'm helping with is C40 Cities, and to see the, the, the city mayors, the mayor representatives, to, to feel comfortable discussing what are the obstacles the challenges that they have in the environment, about sometimes very uh, specific issues like informal settlements where, where decisions are hard to make and the context is complex. Um, and I feel like it's only this environment, this connection to purpose that can actually makes us, make us focus on these aspirations and high ambitions that question the status quo business and actually allows us to be a bit disruptive and creative in the business that we do every day. So this brings this dynamic to the business. I like what you say when you say create memories, Caroline, and of course <laughs> the ambition behind it yeah. to connect the sense of purpose. But what I'd like to do is also ask Mattis to answer the same question because this quantification, you one, when you're doing this, closes the, the stakeholder pool in order to understand the data question. How do you increase the stakeholder pool? How do you make water visible across stakeholders in low trust areas? Yeah, no, I, I think that, um, that that's a crucial question and I think I, I really like the framing of um, the meaning of you know purpose and uh, how do we articulate that but I also do believe that a lot of the time it's about uh, incentives uh, you know it's about uh, incentives and it's about articulating the fact and the ways that um, people are either missing out on benefits that they, that are tangible that can be materialized or are uh, being actively hurt being actively hurt and in uh, those situations in, in those situations, I think it really, really depends on uh, not just showing and being able to demonstrate that, but also uh, really being able to bring that to the decision makers, right? Because oftentimes the communities, they know, they know way better than, than we do, right? But uh, how do you translate it? How do you bring that to the people that actually have the power to make decisions and, and change the course of, uh, of action? And that's a, that's a billion, trillion dollar question. It's very, very difficult, depends on the context. But we have seen that um, the problem oftentimes is that it requires resources. It requires coordination, it requires the time and the effort and the, the financial resources to coordinate, to mobilize voices. And um, that is the fundamental barrier that a lot of institutions, organizations face. And so if we can help with that, whether it's providing uh, the know-how, whether it's providing the, the finance uh, to do that, I think that's a f uh, allowing to overcome the fundamental barrier. Yeah. And uh, so that's the starting point from my perspective. And of course, now we move into talking about the theme for this year, which is br bridging borders, building collaboration. And Rohab, you've heard the, the panelists on stage talk about some of the important keywords that comes to mind when developing strategies to get the right audience for information and context. Given where you sit, and the hardships that you've told us you face with a selective audience, fighting to get the stories heard. Given what you've heard the panelists say today in terms of connecting the stories to emotions, connecting the stories to data, and also making the leadership listen, what do you take away from the conversation that you've heard on center stage?
No, so what you're saying, Rehab, that we're listening to here is that, of course, everyone on the stage has their own networks, has their own ways of working, and of course, that communication, that interoperability between what Rehab is doing, what Mattis is doing, and yes, Caroline, <laughs> that becomes a way forward. Yeah. That becomes a connection, a conversation that's worth having to build these bridges. But I want to end with Caroline because, of course, we've spoken about language, we've spoken about vocabulary, culture, and challenges in bringing the conversation together. So maybe we need to dance this out. <laughs> maybe we need new vocabulary to get us to shift from our traditional ways of thinking about the problem. Caroline, what is the future of communication to create impactful, actionable strategies when it comes to talking about water? Or dancing. <laughs> it's definitely dancing, but I truly <laughs> believe it is really about uh, getting the narrative that is um, creating emotions in the people, creating these visions that people actually feel inspired to be part of the change. And I myself sometimes remind me how great it is to, or how fascinated I am about water and this fascination, bringing it to more people, to broader audiences. And that can be the community radio in South Africa that is bringing local communities together and really making that topic very present in their day-to-day -day times. It can be the football stadium where in the middle is a huge water, is a human right mural. It can be in New York on the Times Square where we see water is a human right visible for everyone. And this is the energy, the unexpected, the suddenly arising, this making people curious, making people want to be more involved and want to participate in a change for water. Join me in giving our panelists on stage and online a warm round of applause. Super interesting. Please do join us at stall 403 outside for Grinfoss's exhibitions and the photographs behind us. Thank you so much. Again, Wednesday is our next Water and Communications. See you on Centre Stage. Thank you.